All right, everybody, time for part two. Let's continue. First, we have Bear Guard Bayonet. This is kind of an interesting card. It's a one cost plus one plus one weapon that gives overwhelm. And on summon, if you pledge this game, you play a copy of that sigil. So this is an is one of the better um, and more interesting pledge payoffs, I would say, since uh, unlike Glasshopper, this accelerates everything you do and also generates card advantage. It just gives you um, an additional sigil of what you pledged rather than the card that you pledged back. <clears throat> but yeah, um, ideally, obviously, you want to play this in a deck with as many one drops as possible, so you can play this on turn two and jump from turn two to turn four, power wise. <laughs> but even if you play it on turn three, it's pretty nice. It gives a decent boost. Um, but yeah, it's a bit of a unique effect since decks that are good at using this, especially using this early, <laughs> might not care as much about the ramp. So we'll have to see how to build a deck that uh, properly benefits from this. But this is definitely a pretty interesting and fairly strong card. Uh, to keep in mind and try and mess around with. Next we have Flexible Familiar. It's a 1 power 1-1 one, one, uh, with Renown and it transforms into a random unit with the same cost as the spell or weapon put on the Familiar. Um, yeah, I don't know. Card is kind of meh. You basically get a random unit with a delay also, you obviously want to use at least a two-cost weapon or a spell on this, which is not that easy because a lot of good spells that you can play in Constructed early, the target units cost one, like Combatrix, Pummel, Finest Hour, all that sort of stuff. But there are a couple of weapons like Katana and stuff. So, I don't know, maybe there's some use for it, but I think the card is too random and high variance to see play in the end. But it's cute, so... It has that going for it. Next we have Honor of Claws, or as Magic players know it, Sift. It's a 4 cost, draw 3, discard a card. This is a really sweet card draw for blue control decks. This fits really well into Reanimator because you can play this on turn 4 and on turn 5. You can play Grasping at Shadows, so this is an amazing boost there. It also happens to play really well in a Horu shell with Privilege of Rank and that sort of stuff. So yeah, this is... A very cool role player for primal decks um, that might uh, make it into multiple decks or even make decks like Horo Control uh, more viable. We'll see. Next we have the Winter Crown. It's a four cost relic. At the end of your turn you draw a card if any of your units hit the enemy player this turn. And once per turn you may pay three to stun a, re a ready enemy unit. So you can only stun a unit that isn't uh, that didn't attack you, so it's basically only working on blockers. You also cannot uh, perma stun a unit, so it's not like a more clunky um, Eye of Winter with upside. So it's definitely much more limited, and that all in all is why I think the card is not going to be particularly playable. Um, but yeah, if you disagree, let me know in the comments why. Next we have the pretty cool new removal, Desecrate. It costs two, but it costs double shadow, so it is kind of restricted. You kill any unit, you take three damage, and it is not fast. So this is pretty interesting for some kind of Stone Sky aggressive deck, because these usually cannot support um, Combust very well, but Desecrate is exactly what these decks want, taking three damage. Doesn't really matter much to them. <coughs> Your removal being fast also doesn't matter too much to them because you mostly just want to kill a blocker before you attack. The only downside is you can't punish like gang blocks, but that's fine. Outside of that, I think the card will mostly be a pretty good market card. Two cost is a good cost for removal in the market, especially if it kills everything. And the three damage are less of a downside if you don't have multiple copies in your deck. But I think uh, multiple copies might otherwise be too punishing in uh, slower decks. And the double shadow will also be too restrictive in your like typical three color mid range or control deck um, to be reliable early on. But yeah, the card's pretty good at what it does. 
Next we have Pony Snatcher, another pretty sweet new card, but another double shadow card on turn 2. So your deck needs to be heavy shadow ideally to support this well. But then you get a 2-2 two -two flying quick draw, which is a pretty solid rate. When it hits the enemy player, you get to steal a random card from their market and add it to yours. If they have none, you gain 2 health instead. The second part uh, is not too likely to come up by the time this happens. Pony Snatcher is probably either dead, or the game is over. Or even if neither of these applies, gaining two health probably doesn't matter too much. Um, but yeah, if you play this on turn two, on the play, you get to steal um, one random card before they even get to access their market. But if you're on the draw, they get to merchant for their uh, for their most important card before Pony Snatcher has a one in five chance to snatch it. So um, yeah, but. The fact that it is a pretty a pretty good um, aggressive two drop uh, makes up for the ability being kind of situational and high variant. So I think you shouldn't go too crazy over the second part of the card. Basically, I think if you don't want a two two flying quick draw that costs double shadow in your deck, you shouldn't put the card in your deck. The second uh, part of text on the card is more of a uh, high variance bonus than anything. But it's nice to see that they start implementing this kind of like market hosing stuff. We'll probably see um, more uh, cards that can do similar things in the future. They probably just want to like take it slow and careful to not, uh, yeah, blow it by being too powerful or too lopsided. Next we have Star Reader's Blade. It's a three cost plus three plus zero weapon. The wielder can't block, so it's pretty expensive and not that great. But when the wielder dies, you draw it from your void, and if you pledge this game, you can play it from your void instead of drawing it. Um, but yeah, since I think a 3 cost plus 3 plus 0 weapon that lets the wielder not block is already kind of a bad deal, I'm not too excited about it coming back for free. And especially if you didn't pledge, it's horrible, because the rate is so bad. If you pledged, it's pretty solid, but... Not sure, maybe there is like some appeal in some kind of like token deck, like it seems like an interesting pseudo uh, payoff card or a shadow heavy go white deck, like I don't know, a Stone Scar, Grenadine, Red Space token deck or just like a Red Space token deck. So I guess that that's like the main angle that I see this being interesting for. So um, yeah, give it a try there maybe, but I don't have too high hopes for the card. Next we have Profane Sensor. They're really dialing in on the like uh, mill strategy with 75 card decks. Not sure how good that's going to be, but sure. Uh, yeah, it's a 5 cost Cursed Relic. And at the end of the Cursed player's turn, they discard 2 cards from the top of the deck for each cursed, a curse on them and their units. So yeah, you basically just slam all the curses in the deck, other mill cards, some interaction, and... That's supposedly your mill strategy here. Not too uh, impressed by this, but I'm pretty sure the card will make a bunch of like uh, casual mill fans really happy. So I think that's what it meant for. It's basically fan service, the card. Next we have a really big one, Koroviat Palace, a new site in the campaign, something that a lot of people were hoping for and nobody was sure if it's actually gonna happen, but it did and it's a really great one. So first of all, your units with four attack or more have endurance, which is a pretty nice um, like marginal static effect on this, especially in a world with cards like Permafrost. This card is going to make Permafrost even more unplayable than it already is in some regards. So um, yeah, kiss your Permafrost goodbye if you ask me. And the agenda is pretty powerful. First of all, we have Wisdom of the Elders drawing true cards straight up unconditional hard card advantage. So at the very worst, this is going to be like maybe breaking a permafrost, drawing you two cards, and the opponent spends four plus damage on killing it. So it's a bunch of life. It's basically like a six cost, um, better, uh, unnerved um, vital arcana, which is amazing. Then we get a new card. We stand that we don't have yet, that my guess would be in the next upcoming set. 
because so far we haven't seen cards on sites that don't actually exist. But maybe this is the first, I'm not 100% sure, but my guess would be this is a backdoor spoiler for a new card in the upcoming set. Give one of the units plus four plus four and each is permanent. So this is the other pretty great mode. Like you have a nice unit in play, you just slam this, make the unit plus four plus four in Aegis. Also happens to protect Palace really well, also happens to gain endurance in the process, no matter what size it is. So you can just attack with it for free and then block to protect the Palace, which is super powerful. And then we have the third card that is not particularly impressive, but there's usually one kind of bad marginal card on the sides. And this one is Sack the City, all the units get Berserk, which is neat, but especially in the kind of decks that will mostly uh, play this deck, uh, will be very situational and marginal, but that's fine. The other two cards are really powerful. Uh, and the um, once the agenda is complete, we get Svetia Orin of Kosul, which is also not that impressive because she's this is once again basically one of those spell sites that I said that you play for its agenda, not for um, the person you get from the agenda, because obviously by the time this happens, it's going to be turn eight, uh, actually turn nine, and yeah, by turn nine. A forecast 4 4 is going to be pretty underwhelming in a lot of decks that you play this. You don't have a lot of units, so the uh, pay 8 ability of Svetia is not that strong either. And the summon effect is like kind of okay ish. So, yeah, all in all, the, the side is powerful for its uh, static ability and for wisdom and withstand. Not so much for Sector City and Svetia. But yeah, the card is amazing. It's at least as good as Howling Peak, possibly a bit better. Um, card is a new powerhouse and is gonna change um, the format uh, massively. Next we have Diogo Malaga Elonze, whatever Elonze means. Um, it's a 4 cost 3-5, just like old Diogo. Uh, instead of a second red, he costs a primal influence, so it's a Yenef card. He has pledge, so he's nice fixing and when you play your third spell in a turn your units get flying this turn which is a neat marginal bonus but the big deal here and the build around is it has amplify 2 and you give the top spell of your deck destiny obviously the ideal plan here is to put one important powerful spell in your deck to guarantee it gets destiny from this and then keep playing it uh, for free like the biggest thing that comes to mind here is invoke the waste zones because it keeps looping itself if you give it destiny. Um, not sure how cute this is going to be and if it's actually going to be good, but it's definitely going to be pretty cool and pretty fun, so people will be messing around with it. And we'll see if there is an actual good deck there. Outside of this, the card is just like kind of decent-ish and um, some solid value. The problem is in a typical Yenev deck, there might be cards that you give Amplify to that are even kind of bad that you have to play them right away. <clears throat> like certain removal, if you just draw it and have to play it at an unopportune time, is it can be actually kind of hurtful. Next we have Vargo Redclaw, the first spoiler that we've seen uh, from the new set, and a pretty powerful one. It's a 4 cost 5-4, it has Bledge, so it's another uh, fixing for its Trifaction. And yeah, Vago can't be killed except by damage or loss of life. Also happens to combo pretty well with um, Koroviat Palace. And is just going to be a big part in reviving an X2 midrange strategy. So now we don't just have like uh, Winchest and Yenev midrange. Now we also get X2 midrange back. Or maybe even lose Yenev midrange in the process because Palace is so strong. And so uh, punishing to Yenev. So I feel like all this campaign is going to mostly do is probably replace Yenev in the metagame with x and then we have like x and Winchest and I don't know, a bit of uh, a bit of Haunting Scream and Reanimator, but I don't know, we'll have to see. I'm a bit cynical at this point. So uh, yeah. Next we have Cameron the Fox, the Fox costs 3-3. The Trifaction Pledge card for Winchest, and once per turn you may sacrifice another unit that hit the enemy player to draw a card and give Cameron plus two plus two. Um, not too impressed with the card, 
the thing is, in order to hit the enemy player, the unit ideally needs to have a certain size to get through, because unless your opponent is doing Stone Cold nothing, they're just going to block small units like Renadins and stuff. And then do you really want to sack the unit? Like how how big of a unit you want to sack to turn it into a plus two plus two buff to a single card and cycle it, which is kind of a tempo setback. And then if the opponent kills Cameron, it's a pretty big tempo blow and that sort of stuff. So yeah, don't have too high hopes for the card. Um, maybe it works in like a Winchest Grenadine shell, but even there it seems kind of situational, fragile and a lot of work. But I don't know. I mean, you can at least attack then play her post combat and immediately make her a 5-5 so she doesn't die to stuff like Torch and um, the Yenf display. So that's a bonus, something to keep in mind. But yeah, I don't think the card is too playable. And last but not least, we have the, the other two uh, Trifaction Blood cards. One that we already discussed as a spoiler, Andrik Renegade Priest. He's a 2-4. All these Trifaction Blood cards co require a single influence of each uh, of each faction and cost 4, so no difference here. He's a 2-4, when a player draws an additional card, increase its cost by 3, so with ramp on the play you can even affect the opposing merchant or smuggler with this, which is kind of neat, but it also affects you, so keep that in mind. So if you skip your turn 3 with your smuggler or merchant and do it like turn 4 after playing this on turn 3 with acceleration, it's gonna hit hurt you too. So that's problematic. The Empower is kind of cool, but that also kind of makes it a, five, uh, a turn 5 play in a way, because otherwise it's kind of a weak turn 4 play as a 2-4 that has no immediate impact. Uh, as a 5 drop though, you can play it and then basically play 6-6 six, six instead, split, split in 2 and half of those stats and the more proactive part of the stats have pseudo charge, which is kind of nice. But the card is a bit of an oddball, so I'm not sure if and how it's going to fit anywhere. But it's not bad, it's not underpowered, it's just kind of weird and not sure if it has a place. And the last one is Severin the Mad Mage. It's a 4-5 pledge once again. Your relics cost one less to play and activate. And on summon you play a random ring. You remember the five rings and you just get one of them for a random for free randomly and then you can activate it for two uh, with Severin. So this is actually kind of decent for five is a decent stat line for a four drop with all the bonuses so maybe there is some kind of Aurelian deck that wants this card but I'm not 100% sure it's still a bit gimmicky but we'll have to see. Okay this wraps up all the um, new cards in Homecoming. Uh, as usual let me know in the comments what you guys think of the cards and the campaign. I really liked it that the campaign was um, was all pre-constructed decks. I kind of hate having to play these campaigns with regular ladder decks, especially if, you, if I'm kind of sick of them. And it also isn't very flavorful and very cool. And having these random pre-constructed decks makes it a bit more challenging, a bit more interesting, a bit more different, and feel different from the usual uh, ladder play, which is nice. Uh, maybe they could add the option in the future to also play it with your own decks for people that prefer that or struggle too much with the pre-constructed decks, um, which isn't likely but possible. So um, yeah, that is something uh, to keep in mind. But all in all, I liked it. Story-wise, the uh, campaign didn't seem that interesting or as cool as some of the prior campaigns, but oh well, it's a part of the story that needs to be told, I guess. And this one was just not as interesting or exciting to me and some others maybe. Um, and yeah, if you enjoyed the video, hit the like button, share it with your friends. And yeah, uh, don't forget to subscribe for more uh, Eternal with the new campaign in the coming days and weeks. Also check out my social media. Um, you can find me live streaming on Twitch with the new campaign and trying new decks and stuff. And you can also find me on like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and so on. I just recently set up an Instagram uh, as well alongside the other channels. So check all of that in the description down below. And yeah, please consider whitelisting YouTube on your ad blog to help support the free content. And that's it again for this time. I'm your host Manu S. I thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.